Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our online service. The title of my, of my sermon this morning is To Know and Understand God. That's what, a, what a powerful concept. And we read of this in Jeremiah chapter 9. But before we do, let us just start this morning in prayer. Father, uh, we come together in your name today with a desire to know and understand you more. And, and we ask God through your spirit that you will come and reveal more of yourself to us. Give us insight into the way you think and the way you do that we may know you more. Like Moses prayed, Lord, teach me your ways that I may know you. Lord, we ask you this morning that you will teach us more of yourself that we may know you more. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 9 speaks of this concept of knowing and understanding God. It says here, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories, glories in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. What a powerful concept. God says we should not glory, boast in our wealth, our fame, our riches, our, 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 our strength, but that we should boast in our understanding and knowing God. We should glory in understanding and knowing God. And then God gives us insight into this glory of understanding and knowing Him. It's so powerful that there are three things in which God delights. And it's so interesting, when one can go a long way to understand a person if you know what he loves. For example, my wife, she loves cities. She loves the comfort and of, of a clean, modern environment. She loves walking down the streets, doing sightseeing, visiting coffee shops, and eating food in a restaurant. Me, on the other hand, I love the nature. I love being out in the wild with as little as possible. Give me a sleeping bag and a poncho that I can sleep under the stars. I enjoy the extreme weather. The more difficult it is, the greater the adventure. How long can I stay dry under this poncho? I just love nature and everything that it brings with it. But now, if you understand who my wife is, and you want to bless her with a weekend away, it will not pay the same dividends if you take her to the mountains with a poncho and a sleeping bag as it would if you take her to the city in a nice, clean, modern hotel. And so too, God encourages us that we should know and understand Him because with that comes great reward. And so God challenges us that we must try and find out what are the things that really pleases him. He says, let man not boast glory in his wealth, his riches, and his might, but let him boast glory in this, that he understands and knows me. And then he says, these are the three things in which I delight. These are the three things that really pleases me. These are the things that I love. Steadfast love justice, and righteousness. Now it's very interesting in Ephesians 5, verse 8 to 10, we read, For you were once of darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. This verse has been coming up quite often, and it is so profound that God encourages us to go find out what are the things that pleases Him. We are encouraged to find out, to search for that what pleases God. In Colossians 1 verse 9 to 10, it says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you, continually asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, and that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. What are the things that pleases the Lord? What are the things that God delights in? And it's so important for us to ask this question and to search for the answers 
so that we may live it to the full and therefore bring glory and pleasure to God in doing so. And I really want to encourage you in this time where we are limited in our, in our, in our fellowship with others around us that you will embark on this journey to, to discover what are the things that pleases God and that, and that we will pursue to do those things so that we may know and understand Him more. A good place to start is these three things that God mentions here in Jeremiah. It is this concept of steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. Now, God delights in love, and, and we know this very well. We, we've heard so many sermons around this concept that God loves it. He delights in it when we love each other, when we love our neighbor, even when we love our enemies. We know this because God is love. And, and love is not just an um, expression of His character. It, it, is, it is an expression of His essence. God is love. And therefore, when we love, we, we are drawn to Him. And, and, and the more we know that He loves, and that He loves when we love, the more we love. And in this process of doing what, what pleases Him, loving each other and loving our neighbor, we become more like Him, even to the point where we love our enemies, just like He loved us when we were enemies. But God also loves justice. Therefore, when we love our enemies, it doesn't mean they will escape justice for the wrong that they did. But justice is not just about judgment. Justice is far more than that. Justice is about doing what is right, and ensuring that right is done to all. See, it's very interesting. The most powerful way love and justice overlaps is when we care for the poor. The poor who are marginalized, disempowered, and unable to provide for themselves, when we love them and care for them, we are doing justice in God's sense. Because we are helping those who cannot help themselves. It is not right for anyone that they should be without food, shelter, or clothing. It is not right. It is not justice in the earth to see anyone go without food, without shelter, and without clothing. And God desires us to do justice to all. Worse still, when the poor is exploited so that others may God, it is an injustice. And God loves it when we care for those who have lack in their time of need. But justice is more than just giving to the poor. Justice is when we stand up for the weak, the marginalized, and the poor, the widow and the orphan. When we defend their rights, when we fight their cause, when we speak on their behalf. This is doing justice. And God delights in it when we defend the weak, the widow, the marginalized, and the poor. When we stand up for them. And we fight for their cause. In Psalm 82, from verse 3, we read, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. The NIV puts it powerfully. It says, Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. You see, that is justice. That, that is in what God delights when we defend the weak and the marginalized. A Proverbs 31 verse 8 to 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Isaiah uh, chapter 1 verse 17, Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. You see, God loves justice. And when we stand up for the right of those who are marginalized and disempowered, God enjoys it. He's pleased with us when we stand up for the rights for those who cannot stand for themselves. Isaiah 58, verse 6 to 7, we read the following. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring in your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him 
and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Is this not the fast that I required, says God? Is this not my intent and my purpose? To see justice done to those who cannot fend for themselves. You see, God is our heart for the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, the weak. I always say it's so clear to see within Scripture that God has an affirmative agenda. He wants the poor and the marginalized to be restored to their full right in society. He delights in us when we act on their behalf and when we give to their need. In John 3, verse 17 to 18, he says, But if anyone has this world's goods and see his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Not only does God expect us to care for the poor and to give to them. You know, it's so powerful. God says that He will repay us when we do. It's so powerful to read in, in Proverbs 19 verse 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and He will repay him. For this deed. It's such a powerful concept. As a, as a young Christian, and when, when I started off in the ministry, I was given the responsibility to, to take care of the poor. And this is one of the verses that really spoke to me. And it is so powerful. I want to read it again. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Something that we can really meditate upon. God has a heart for the poor. And that when we become His hands and feet to serve the poor, God says, not only do I notice, but I will repay you for this. Something that really stood out for me also as a young Christian is, is, the, is the story of Cornelius. Cornelius the centurion to whom Peter preached and the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles for the first time. It's a powerful event in the history of church but it was so interesting when, when the angel appeared to Cornelius, he said that your, your prayers and your arms have become like a monument before God. Such a powerful concept. The angel says to Cornelius that your prayers and your giving to the poor has become like a monument before God. Now, a monument is something that reminds us of a person and what he has done. Every time I go to Cape Town and I see the monument of Jan van Riebeek, I'm reminded of this person that came to this country to establish the Cape Colony. I'm reminded of what he done and what he established. That is what a monument does. When we pass the monument of Nelson Mandela, we are reminded of the man that brought freedom to our country and this great way in which he led our country. We are reminded of the person and what he has done. And so God says that our giving to the poor has become like a monument before him. And so God responds to this monument and grants Cornelius to receive the Holy Spirit. God notices when we give to the poor. And God says that he will reward us for it. God says if you give to the poor... We lend to Him, and think about this, He will repay us for everything. He takes note, and He's reminded of it, and He will repay us for it. Jesus said the following uh, about being generous to the poor in Luke 14, verse 14, And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. What the poor cannot give you, God will give you. But God also blesses us in this life. In Deuteronomy 15 verse 10, which is also all about giving to the poor, we read here from verse 10, Give generously to them, so and, and do so without grudging in your heart. Then because of this, the Lord will bless you and in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. What a powerful promise that if we give to the poor without a grudgingness in our heart, God will bless us in everything that we do. In 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, we read the following. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God 
loves a cheerful giver. What pleases the Lord? A cheerful giver. And God, listen to this, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. For myself? No. Listen carefully. For as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness and you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expression of thanks to God. How powerful is this? That our giving is not just meeting a need, it is resulting in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. And God says, I will enable you, I will enrich you so that you in every opportunity in every circumstance, will have an opportunity, will have the ability to bless others. But the reason for the blessing is so that we can be a blessing. And so powerfully, so that God may receive the glory and the thanksgiving and the worship. It is in our giving to others that there are many expressions of thanksgiving, not towards us, but towards God. That is the purpose of giving. The result of our giving is to bring thanksgiving to God. The result of our giving will overflow into many expressions of joy and worship to God. So our giving should never be about us. Our giving should always be to the other, the other that have the need, and God who receives the glory. So what pleases God most? What are the things that, that God delights in? It is the things that, that brings thanksgiving and worship to Him. It's the things that expresses His character and nature in the world. Reflects His heart. And so I want us to remind ourselves again of Jeremiah 9 verse 23 that says, And thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories, glories in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. In these things I delight, says the Lord. So let us therefore continue to find out what are the things that pleases the Lord that we may understand and know Him more, that, that we may be fruitful in every good work so that He may receive the honor and the thanksgiving for it. And you know what? In the process of understanding, knowing, and doing these things that pleases the Lord, we ourselves are blessed by God. He will repay us for what we sow so that we can be uh, enriched in every way so that in every opportunity, we can be a blessing to those around us. So I want to encourage us all to continue to consider what are the things that blesses the Lord and live that to the full. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for giving us your Son, not out of obligation, but out of an expression of compassion and love for us. When we were still enemies, you died for us. When we were powerless, you came to save us. We were poor, and you made us rich. You became poor on our behalf so that we may inherit the kingdom of God. And Lord, you call us as your sons and daughters to go into the world and to fight for the cause of the poor, to give, to speak, to defend, and to establish. God, I pray, Lord, that you will grant us the wisdom and the faith and the desire, not just to give, but to defend, to speak, and to establish justice on the earth, so that you may be glorified through it. And we thank you that we can ask you this in Jesus' name.
Amen. In this time of need, I want to really encourage you, if you want to give to the poor, one way of doing that is to sow into our body serve account. The body serve account is specifically there to meet the needs of the believers within the body who are in need, whether it's physical or financial. We want to bless those who are in need. And, and through giving into the body serve account, you enable us to do that. And the reason we want to do it that way, if you want to bless somebody in the church, please, instead of giving that person the money yourself, Rather, donate that money into the body serve account with their name as a reference. And then we'll make sure that that entire amount goes to that person. But when that person receives that money, they will give glory to God and they won't be obligated to you as an individual. And so I want to encourage us as we continue to give in the normal account, but also to consider the body serve account through which we can bless the believers and those beyond. And I want to thank everyone who has been giving into this account. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that as we bring glory and many expressions of thanks to God because of the goodwill and the provision that God has made available to so many people. Thank you so much and my God bless you.